Hey biology people, this is Mr. Gales again and I'm going to be talking to you today about the diagrams in your packet that relate to cell biology. So we're looking at diagrams pages 79 through 90. This is primarily for those of you that have missed class over the last couple of days for one reason or another, um, but it also could be used as a review for those of you that want to have just one more opportunity to, to hear the discussion regarding cell structures. There's a lot of writing on these documents. We've done this in class, so what I'm going to do is just put these uh, documents up on the screen here so that you can see them. I'll talk a little bit about them, kind of explain, and then as you need to, you can pause the video and then annotate your documents as is necessary. Some of these documents uh, are really important because they're going to give you some information that you'll need to study for the, for the exam for this unit. There are some electron micrographs, uh, which are photographs taken with an electron microscope, that you'll need to be able to interpret. This is an electron micrograph. It's actually a transmission electron micrograph of a red blood cell. Now, this is not one of those that we're going to ask you to interpret for the exam, but it's an example of what that looks like. So let's go ahead and start. Uh, the first structure that we're looking at on page 79 is the cell membrane, also known as the plasma membrane, does two major things. Its most basic job is that it separates the interior of the cell from the external environment. And you can see that very clearly over here. Uh, the outside of the cell and the inside of the cell. And the way that it does that is it forms a hydrophobic barrier between the two regions. Remember that a cell is mostly water and its environment is mostly water. All living things are made up of mostly water. So what we have is a, a membrane which serves as a barrier between um, the inside and the outside areas. I have a model here of a cell membrane that I'm going to just quickly show you. This is a model of a phospholipid bilayer, or at least a section of a phospholipid bilayer. And this internal section here, these, these gray structures, those are the phospholipid tails, which are nonpolar and hydrophobic, and therefore any polar substance or large bodies of water are not going to be able to interact in that area. We saw what happens when you mix oil and water together, they separate. Okay, the second major function of the membrane is it serves as a selectively permeable barrier. It allows or controls the movement of certain materials into and out of the cell and blocks others. Now, this will be something that we discuss in more detail later on in our unit. Uh, essentially, the way that it does this is, again, based on the chemistry of the membrane. The phospholipid bilayer, it's called a bilayer because there are two layers of phospholipids lined up tail to tail. And again, I'm going to take my model here. This time I'm going to do this kind of situation. I've got a phospholipid there, two fatty acid chains with a phosphate group at the top, and they line up tail to tail like that. These areas down here are the hydrophobic barrier regions, and then up here at the top we have the hydrophilic parts that will interact with water. So phosphate groups and lipid tails. Uh, because of this barrier, polar substances are not going to be able to travel through the internal part of the membrane. And so what happens is it, 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 it allows the cell to have this selective permeability. More on that a little bit later. Now one question that came up in class was, well, how then do certain polar substances like sugar molecules enter the cell? And if you look carefully, you'll see that there are various proteins embedded in the membrane. Those proteins have many functions, but one function is to transport substances across the cell membrane. All right, we're going to skip now to page 80. Page 80 highlights the nucleus of the cell, and um, the, we're going to look at three specific structures related to the nucleus, and then the genetic material itself. So the nucleus is a membrane-bound structure containing the genetic material, as well as something called a nucleolus. Uh, the importance here is that it maintains the integrity of the genetic information. This is an adaptive advantage for cells because if the genetic information is damaged or destroyed, then obviously the cell is not able to function because the DNA controls the sort of the genetics and the, the biochemistry of the cell. Um, so having a nucleus protects that. Now, one thing to keep in mind is if genetic information was never allowed to change, then every living thing would be identical, and that would be a problem as well. So there has to be a balance between maintaining integrity of genetic information and having a mechanism for controlled change, and that mechanism is what we call a mutation. We'll talk more about that as we move into second semester. The nucleolus is the site of ribosome synthesis. The nucleolus is found within the nucleus, dark dense structure in the middle of the nucleus. There can be more than one, and if there are more than one, they're referred to as the nucleoli inside the nucleus. 
nuclear envelope. This is a lipid bilayer, which should tell you that it's also a membrane, and it encloses the, the nucleus. Um, if you look at the diagram here, you'll see that the nuclear envelope contains pores, and those pores allow for passage of certain materials to move in and out. One thing that clearly has to move out of the nucleus are the ribosomes that are made in the nucleoli. Um, we also need to be able to take RNA and move it out of the nucleus into the cytoplasm to interact with the ribosomes for protein synthesis. Uh, additionally, think about what the nucleus is in charge. The nucleus has where the nucleic acids are, so the building blocks of the nucleic acids need to be able to brought into the nucleus uh, so they can be assembled together. So you've got to bring in pentose sugars, nitrogenous bases, phosphate groups, and they can all be assembled within the nucleus. Now speaking of the genetic information, when you look at your diagram up at the top, you see this word chromatin, and it's pointed to these very fine threads, which may be difficult for you to detect on this camera. The fine strands of DNA and protein together form what are called chromatin strands, and the, the chromatin is what forms chromosomes as the cell gets ready to divide. During the majority of the cell's life cycle, uh, this genetic material exists as chromatin, and then during cell division, which we would call mitosis or meiosis, the chromatin condenses into visible chromosomes. All right, moving along, we're going to go to page 81. Page 81 features ribosomes. And if you take a look here at the diagram, um, we can see two specific types of ribosomes. We have what are called free ribosomes and bound ribosomes. Uh, we need to begin with what ribosomes do. Ribosomes are the site of the assembly of amino acids into proteins. And something that is kind of an interesting connection to what goes on in the nucleus, the sequence of amino acids is really determined by the genetic message, the genetic information. When you look at another person sitting near you, the reason you look different from them is you have slightly different proteins from them. And that slight difference in the proteins results from slight differences in your DNA. Now, two types of ribosomes. Free ribosomes are floating in the cytoplasm. Uh, those generally are involved in producing proteins that are going to be used in the cell. So, for instance, an enzyme related to an activity inside, inside the cell. Bound ribosomes are attached to the endoplasmic reticulum, and generally speaking, those are proteins that are produced for export out of the cell. So for instance, like a hormone would be an example. Page 82. This features the endomembrane system, or the endomembrane highway inside the cell. Endo means inside, so this is a system of membranes inside the cell. And in general, it is involved with, or serves as a pathway uh, for proteins to move throughout the cell. Four steps, or four parts to this. And you can see I've numbered them on the diagram, and then we'll talk about them over here. Uh, in number one, proteins are synthesized on the rough endoplasmic reticulum. Number two, they are sent in what's called a transport vesicle. This term vesicle just refers to any general, it's a generic term for a membrane-bound container. So they're sent in a transport vesicle to the cis face of the Golgi apparatus. The cis face is the face that faces the nucleus. So there's the cis face. At the Golgi apparatus, these proteins are packaged or modified into membranes. They might be chemically changed a little bit. It prepares them for usage, and it also protects them as they travel throughout the cell. Uh, and then number four, they're sent from the Golgi apparatus in a transport vesicle where they leave from what's called the trans face. This is called the trans face here. And they're sent from the transface of the Golgi apparatus to the cell membrane, where they are then further released from the cell. So this is, in general, how a cell produces a protein for export and moves it through the cell to its final destination. Okay, 83. Endoplasmic reticulum. This is something that you'll need to be able to identify and interpret for your exam. Uh, endoplasmic reticulum. Endo means interior or inside. Plasmic refers to the material inside the cell, so member, the, the cytoplasm in the cell, and reticulum is network. So this is a network of internal membranes. Smoothie R does not have ribosomes. It's used for lipid synthesis. So for instance, if the cell membrane is breaking down and new phospholipids need to be produced, they're produced in the smoothie R. Also for the breakdown of toxins, for instance, alcohol is detoxified in smoothie R. So the, your liver which is a, an organ that's involved in detoxification of alcohol and other drugs, um, has lots of smoothie R in it. 
Rough endoplasmic reticulum does have ribosomes, so this is involved in the transport of proteins that are produced for export. And if you look at the picture here, you can see the rough endoplasmic reticulum. Clearly, rough's got the ribosomes on it, and the smooth ER has that very uh, smooth look to it. No ribosomes attached. Page 84 is the Golgi apparatus. As I mentioned earlier, the Golgi apparatus modifies and packages proteins so that they are prepared for being shipped uh, either within the cell or out of the cell. Oftentimes, I, I use the analogy of um, a factory producing a product. Like if you're producing a video game, if you produce a bunch of the video game discs and you were just to throw them into a container, um, and then that container was carried to the store, and people had to sort of sort through the container to find the disc that they wanted. By the time they got their disc, it would be all scratched up and damaged, and it probably wouldn't work anymore. Same thing happens with, cell, uh, with cellular products like proteins. If you have a protein that's just going to travel through the cell on its own, it can get damaged, it can be broken apart, it will lose its function. So the Golgi apparatus packages it up so that it can be transported uh, effectively. This space of the nucleus here, again, is called the cis space. It faces the nucleus. And we have here where proteins would be built on the rough endoplasmic reticulum and sent to the cis space in what's called a transport vesicle. And you can see that right here. Down over here, we have the trans space. Trans space is going to be identified because it's got lots of transport vesicles. So here we have a transport vesicle budding off of the Golgi apparatus carrying a finalized protein for shipment out of the cell. The trans space faces the cell membrane. And by the way, uh, transport vesicles that are leaving the cell are sometimes referred to as secretory vesicles. Secretory means to secrete. So we're secreting uh, these vesicles from the cell, releasing them. Okay. All right. PG85 just real quickly shows the formation of a lysosome. And uh, again, what happens is the protein is made by a protein on the rough endoplasmic reticulum, an enzyme in this case, put into a transport vesicle, sent to the Golgi so it can be packaged into its membrane sac. In this case, a lysosome is a, a vesicle that contains digestive enzymes. What it can be used for is to fu uh, fuse together with food vacuoles to digest those food particles. Uh, white blood cells have a lot of lysosomes because the digestive enzymes can be used for breaking down uh, invading particles like bacteria. And if you look on page 86, there are two pictures of lysosomes in action. This shows a white blood cell, and again, you can see lots of lysosomes here um, destroying infectious particles. Over on this side, we have a lysosome which has engulfed a fragment of an organelle called a peroxisome and another uh, fragment of an organelle called a mitochondrion, and they're simply breaking down these organelles that are damaged or don't work anymore. This is called autophagy, eating yourself. It's kind of an interesting process. All right, 87. We're almost done. 87 is the chloroplast. We talked about the chloroplast with reference to endosymbiotic theory, but a couple things I just want to go over again. Uh, actually, this is, this is before we get to the details of the chloroplast. Plant cell. Things that you're going to identify as being uh, characteristic of the plant cell. The ridge, the thick and rigid outer covering of plant cells uh, provides support to the plant cell. And you'll notice that it, the plant cell wall here has openings in it. And those openings are called plasmodesmata. Now, the, the cell wall itself is not permeable. Substances cannot travel through that cell wall. It's a rigid outer covering. The plasmodesmata are holes through which substances can travel, and then they need to interact with the cell membrane, which is just inside. You can see that the cell wall is cut away here, and that there's a cell membrane inside the cell wall. Chloroplasts are found in plant cells. You can see one of those here. And then the large central vacuole is the major feature of this page. It's used for storage of water and nutrients. Uh, it has a membrane itself called the tonoplast. It's the outer covering of the vacuole. And one important role that the vacuole plays for plant cells is when uh, the vacuole is filled with water, it will expand like a water balloon. And as it expands, it pushes all the organelles and, and all the contents of the cell up against the cell membrane and against the cell wall. And that keeps the cell rigid. It's called turgid. Uh, the pressure of the water pushing against the cell wall is referred to as turgor pressure. 
So a plant that has been watered frequently and stands upright and looks really healthy has turgor pressure. If you fail to water a plant for several days, what will happen is the water leaves the vacuole and the vacuole collapses down and it becomes flaccid. It becomes, uh, uh, it sort of wilts down like that. Okay. Before we get to the details of the chloroplast, we're going to look at the details of the mitochondria. Now, mitochondria are found both in plant cells and animal cells. Uh, these are referred to as the powerhouse of the cell. They're involved in doing the reaction called cellular respiration, which breaks down glucose and turns it into the ce cellular energy currency that we call ATP. Um, as we've seen in the thermodynamics unit, cellular respiration is essentially oxidizing a glucose molecule in the presence of oxygen to extract bits of energy from it and then put that energy into the ATP molecule. Uh, there is an outer membrane, which is the membrane resulting from the engulfing of these original cells during uh, endocytosis. And then there's an inner membrane, and the inner membrane, recall, is the original prokaryotic membrane. It's got the characteristics of a prokaryotic membrane. Uh, the folds on the inner membrane are called the cristae, the infolding of the inner membrane. And it's the cristae where the reactions of cellular respiration, uh, I'll write this down here, the electron transport chain, or ETC, of cellular respiration occurs on the cristae. Uh, essentially what that is, it's the process that ultimately generates the maximum amount of ATP for the cell. Then you have over here in the mitochondria the matrix. Now the matrix is the cytoplasm-like fluid that's filled with enzymes, and what occurs over here is the Krebs cycle of cellular respiration. The Krebs cycle is a series of reactions that essentially strips off the electrons, sort of oxidizes the, the sugar molecules and the, the products of the sugar molecules as they are broken down. All right, now we go to the chloroplast. All right, again, our plant cell chloroplast. Well, obviously, chloroplasts uh, are the site of photosynthesis, which is the reaction that plants use to make their own food molecules. They contain chlorophyll, which is a green pigment that absorbs light. So when we look at color drawings of plant cells or pictures of plant cells, we see green because of the abundance of chlorophyll. Again, there's an inner and outer membrane, which resulted from the endosymbiosis that occurred um, between 3.5 and, and 1.5 billion years ago, right? That evolutionary process. Um, the inside, we see the granum, which is the stacks of what we call these thylakoids. And a thylakoid, an individual thylakoid, is the individual infolding of that inner membrane. What it does is it increases surface area for the light reactions to occur. So when you have a whole stack of those, we call those granum or grana, and you can imagine how much surface area you can get by having all that infolding. The stroma is an enzyme-filled fluid where uh, the Calvin cycle of photosynthesis occurs. So the, the stroma of the chloroplast would be analogous to the matrix of the mitochondrion, and the thylakoid of the chloroplast would be analogous to the cristae of the mitochondrion. This is, by the way, something that you'll need to make sure that you study for your exam as well. And I think I neglected to mention this, but the Golgi apparatus is another one of those that needs to be studied for the exam. All right, this is it. This is the last one. Cytoskeleton. Uh, real simple, just it's the internal framework of the cell. It's made up of st structures called microtubules and microfilaments. It's, uh, it, it's virtually invisible with microscopes. Um, it, it, if you think about a building that's being built, before you put the exterior walls on, you build the framework. So this is like the internal framework that sort of holds all the structures into place. One example or one important component of that cytoskeleton are called centrioles. Now, centrioles are found in animal cells, and they're used for cell division. They help to pull the chromosomes apart during cell division. Um, plant cells don't have centrioles, per se. They have something called a centrosome forming, something called a microtubule organizing center. And that is similar to, to centrioles, but it's, it's just a little bit different. So I know that was a lot of information. Again, if you've missed class, uh, this is what we've done the last couple of days. 
gone through all these uh, various structures and the details related to them. If you were in class and you're looking at this, it's probably just because you wanted to get a little refresher on it. So in any case, if you have questions, please make sure you let us know, and uh, we'll see you next time in biology.